for 13 days near the end of the latest Colombian dry season. Fluval brand ambassador Tom Sarek led an expedition team across 2,600 kilometers of the Llanos, a vast tropical grassland plain situated to the east of the Andes. The group's mission was simple, to understand and witness the rich biodiverse environment firsthand, implement their learnings into creating habitat-accurate products for the home aquarium hobby, and lastly, bring awareness to help protect this precious natural environment from threats such as deforestation, mining, and oil and gas production. Still aching from the scores of inoculations we pumped our bodies with in order to prepare for the trip and avoid such pleasantries as malaria and yellow fever, Oliver and I began the first leg of our journey by boarding the six-hour flight from Toronto, Canada to Bogota, Colombia, approximately 4,500 kilometers due south. Once we touched down in Bogota, we met up with our guide coordinator, Hernando, who picked us up and proceeded to drive us three and a half hours down a narrow, winding, mountainous highway to the town of Villa Vincenzio. It was here that Alexandro, a well-respected local fisherman, joined the rest of Team Fluval. Colombia, with 46 million citizens, has the second largest Spanish-speaking population in the world after Mexico. Its key exports include coffee, fruits, vegetables, timber, and tropical fish approximately 150 species or so of tropicals. The country is made up of a mix of cultures originating from indigenous Amerindians, European immigrants and African slaves. Its diversity is about as colorful as its history, which was plagued by four decades of civil war and urban violence, combined with mass poverty rates that forced millions of Colombians to move out of the country during the last century. A rebound economy in the 2000s, however, improved the living standards for many Colombians and greatly instilled new feelings of hope and prosperity. The current political reality is relatively stable, despite periodic insurgency from the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC as they are more commonly known. FARC is a Marxist-Leninist-inspired peasant army claiming to represent the rural poor in a struggle against Colombia's rich and powerful. A guerrilla organization, they're financed primarily by kidnappings and drug trafficking. Luckily for us, we didn't encounter any of their faction throughout the expedition as they have been displaced towards the Venezuelan border by the official Colombian army, who I should add has brought stability and freedom to its people, not to mention provide a valuable source of employment to a significant segment of Colombian youth. Whenever we did happen to travel near the border during certain points of the trip, the regional division of the Colombian Army, led by Colonel Sanchez, were kind enough to review our travel plans, update us on the latest FARC sightings, and guide our team towards safer routes. We were even provided with the Colonel's personal cell phone number, just in case any unfortunate encounters were turned up along the way. Fortunately, most all of our run-ins were with the warm and friendly farmers, fishermen, and other typical rural folk, all of whom welcomed us with smiles and pleasant greetings wherever we went. Colombia's geography, or at least the infrequently traveled areas we visited, is unfortunately not as hospitable in comparison. As an example, we never reached the Rio Tomo River as hoped later in the trip thanks to a dilapidated log bridge located just beyond a deserted town, which no amount of money in the world would have tempted us to cross. Furthermore, it wasn't uncommon at some points of our expedition to take more than half a day just to travel 100 kilometers. As trying as some of the terrain was, I have rarely seen so much ecological variety and beauty in all my travels. Colombia is number two on the planet in terms of greatest biodiversity and includes everything from marshes to reefs, rainforests to snow-covered mountains. The country is also known to have the second largest river in all of South America, the Orinoco, which is surpassed only by the mighty Amazon. Colombia is also renowned for receiving consistent luminosity throughout the year with an equal duration of day and night. The rivers themselves are just as fascinating Whitewater rivers, such as the Rio Orinoco, were literally the color of white due to all the silt. 
Blackwater rivers like the Rio Muco, on the other hand, have very dark colored water despite having a white sand bottom. These are usually very soft and are extremely low in conductivity with a pH value often below 5.5, which is favored by one of the most graceful freshwater fish, the Altam Angel. As a side note, throughout our trip we never registered pH above 6.3. The cage was always less than 10 ppm and the water temperature, at least in the lowlands, were usually somewhere around 27 degrees Celsius. Colombia also has many clear water rivers and streams such as the Cano Verde, with great visibility for snorkeling, filming and photography. It was for this reason we focused primarily on this type of water during the expedition. As I mentioned previously, the Fluval team was visiting Colombia during a dry season. Some of the largest rivers, such as the Orinoco, can experience up to 15 meter drops in water level during this time of year. The reasons we selected to travel during the dry season were because the Llanos would have been a nightmare to navigate during the flooding of the rainy season. The fish are more concentrated in smaller volumes of water, and the insect population is held somewhat in check. The Llanos was severely parched, with many aquatic habitats drying up. As we drove from one area to another, we often saw dehydrated capybara passed away along the roadsides, while those that managed to survive still struggled as they traveled through small tracts of water that had yet to evaporate. We even witnessed many birds of prey taking advantage of all the smaller animals and reptiles that were equally affected by the blistering heat and regular brush fires. During this day, we toured the Los Ocaros area of Villa Vincenzio in search of a Corridoris Maytai habitat. Unfortunately, no specimens were recovered due to the poor stream conditions and the human population expansion that has eaten into this natural real estate. Next, we decided to head to a local Cubrata, which is a mountain stream, which was located quite a distance away up a very steep incline. Again, luck not on our side as the truck failed to make the climb and overheated around the halfway mark. I guess a crew of four men loaded with two weeks of gear did not help the situation. So we aborted that mission and moved on to our next scheduled target, Laguna Aquario, which was located near a Colombian army base. Most of the day was spent snorkeling in a morchal not too far from the base, where we saw a beautiful growth of Luigi and Rotala. Colombian morchals are very much an oasis in the dry season and will typically include palm trees growing in whatever water remains. In the Llanos, these palms can often be seen from miles away and are usually a good indicator that water is present. The fish were in abundance this day and we ended up filming pairs of A. Hong Sloy with fry H. unitaniatus, Cyclosoma maytai, Mokenhausia coletti, M. lepidura, and H. maytai. It was not long after leaving the Morichal that we were visited by Colonel Sanchez, a proud and well-respected member of the Colombian Army. Despite his very busy schedule, the Colonel took time to share his expertise of the region with us, which was greatly appreciated. He also left us with a cell phone number, as I mentioned before not only for us to use in case we encountered any danger such as the FARC, but also to report back to the Army if we noticed any questionable activity during our travels. Later this afternoon, we decided to head over to a farm that grows teak trees, which is owned by a close friend of Hernando's. We were provided with a great dinner and comfortable accommodations for the evening. Little did we know how exciting the next day would be. Today, we explored the Cano Mayoragua, a shallow but very picturesque stream meandering through a forest scattered with thick overhanging trees. The base of the stream consists of a fine whitish brown sand, which is covered by fallen leaves, branches and trees that accumulate where the current permits. 
There are very few, if any, aquatic plants to be found here, which are much more representative in the Moore Chiles. The water temperature was 26.2 degrees Celsius on this day. As I was recovering from a nasty sunburn and unwilling to give up the relief I felt from applying local aloe vera plant secretions to my back, I spent most of my time capturing video footage, documenting water chemistry and flow data while the others snorkeled. About 30 minutes into our stop, I heard some excitement from Oliver and Alexandro who were some 25 feet away. I waded over to them to see what the fuss was about but all I heard were the words pike cichlid, pike cichlid from the distance. Now having seen many pike cichlids before, I was wondering what the heck the guys were so excited about. And as I drew closer to the net, it was then I realized they were shouting new pike cichlid. Looking at the team's catch, we knew this was a brand new pike cichlid due to the fish's immediately noticeable W-shaped trident, which is located on the upper side near its gills. We were fortunate to net several specimens, which are documented in detail. The larger ones measured some 20 centimeters in length. The female from the largest pair was sporting a prominent red abdomen surrounded by turquoise highlights. We were obviously excited as this was the first new species we came across on a relatively young expedition, making us feel like we accomplished something significant, which can now be shared with the world. It justified the harsh travel and physical shellacking it took to get us here. I started to understand more clearly that this was, in fact, what exploring is all about. Some of the fish species we observed in the Cano Mayoragua were as follows. Uh, new species of Crenichicla, which we were all excited about, the Mokenhausia coletti, the Darter tetra, Leparinus frederici, Mokenhausia lepidura, Brycon melanopterus, Pimendelis gracilis, and of course, some other species of fish as well. Later that same day, after our discovery, we explored the Blackwater River of the Rio Muco, located within an hour's drive. We parked near a volcanic-like rock outcrop and made our way down a very steep incline, which led into a pure white sandy beach. It was here where we believed to have captured a new potential species of Ancestris, as none of us could recognize having seen it before. We are now doing our due diligence to confirm this theory and will report back at a later time. By nightfall, we started moving on to our next stop in Primavera. To say the roads on the way were extremely bad would be an understatement. As a result, we moved at a snail's pace while the Jeep bounced us around like microwave popcorn. We didn't arrive at our destination until the early hours of the next morning. We stopped for a visual check of the large whitewater river, the Rio Meta. There were tons of caimans perched along the banks of the silted, murky riverfront. My shirt could have been literally melting off my sunburnt back but there was no way on earth I was going to take a quick dip to cool off. We decided to take a few more breaks along our bumpy car travel this day, not only to keep our spirits up, but our lunches down. We rolled into another army base next to check on the status of the part of the Rio Tomo we wanted to explore. Despite our careful planning, we were advised not to venture into our targeted area of the Tomo because of local FARC activity and were instead directed to head toward the mouth of the river. Leaving the base, the team elected to check out another Morichal near Mancho Parezo. Here we waded into very shallow and cloudy water, which made it impossible to conduct any underwater filming. We used nets to collect and observe scores of rams, apistos, and shrimp along the shoreline. Our stop at Mancho Parezo was eventful yet short-lived due to the fact we again spotted large caiman nearby. There were also lots of dried palm fronds spread about, which are favorable hiding spots for poisonous bushmaster snakes. Next, we decided to move on to Nuevo Antioquia. We had difficulty locating Nuevo Antioquia at 3 a.m., partly due to the darkness, but mostly due to fatigue and its resulting hallucinations. Against our better judgment, we decided to sleep in the car. 
You would think that four men sleeping in a cramped 4x4 would be a perfect recipe for murder. But luckily for us, we were all so exhausted that the thought never crossed our minds. In fact, the snoring and occasional moans from our body pain surely kept some potential predators away. During the next few hours, I fell in and out of sleep and noticed at some point that we weren't alone. A single and very curious fox was circling the truck, likely smelling our food rations. This situation was more entertaining than anything else, and despite the fox being naturally curious about us, he kept his distance and never coming within 50 yards. After napping briefly, we finally arrived at Nuevo Antioquia, which ended up only being a couple of kilometers away, to eat a nice warm breakfast. After quickly refueling, it was then on to Puerto Correno by way of the Serenia Hills along the Rio Tomo. We arrived at Puerto Correno, filthy, battered and beaten at about 5 p.m. We checked into a seedy motel complete with trickling cold shower and cockroaches. After a roadside snack, we located a local father-son team to charter their boat for the following day. Our driver and expedition navigator, Hernando, fell ill this day with violent stomach cramps. Unable to accompany us on the boat excursion, he went to a local hospital to be examined. Fortunately, Hernando would be okay, but was in rough shape for the time being. He appreciated the day of rest while we went to explore the fabulous Cano Verde and Cano Negro. The Cano Verde is the stream that drains into the Cano Negro and ultimately the huge Rio Orinoco. We traveled down the Rio Orinoco for approximately 45 minutes, eventually finding the mouth of the Cano Negro. The water level was shallow once again and combined with all the overhanging and fallen trees, made for some very challenging navigation. We had to contort our bodies while inside the boat like a bad game of twister as we passed through all the shrubbery. The captain, a weathered 60-something year old, along with his strong and very capable son, clearly demonstrated their aquatic prowess as they weaved and bobbed around the trees, sandbanks and other obstacles. The fluidity of their navigation impressed us all, which was a nice change of pace from all the rocky roads. Struggling against the strong current of the Cano Negro, we ultimately came across the intersection of the Cano Verde, which had distinctively clear yet slightly greenish water. It was very beautiful here, deep inside the waterways of the Colombian rainforest. Of great surprise was the appearance of so many well-known aquarium fish in such quick-moving water, cichlids, tetras, catfish, stingrays, and others, which goes against much common thought in home fish keeping. We also saw many kingfishers, ducks, peacock bass, three different species of rays, and even a large river otter that jumped into the water right next to our boat. Just so much life everywhere we looked. The Cano Verde, by comparison, is a smaller stream, but still with a fairly strong flow. Here we saw Rumino's tetras swimming against the current, thriving and living beautifully. The clear waters of the stream were packed with fish and we observed many species. Some examples of cichlids were Crinochiclus trigata, Cicla orionocos and Temensis, Biotitoma waverini. We saw Festivum cichlids, we saw Severum cichlids, checkerboard cichlids, and others. In catfish, we saw some Ancestrus species, some very large Hypostomus species, Farloellas were pulled off many branches and observed. Stingrays, we saw Motoro, Schroederi, and Obigni. In Caracinidae, we saw Semiprochilotus and Cygnus, beautiful schools of their reflective silver scales swimming all around us, was absolutely beautiful. Leporinus wyforus, an absolutely gorgeous fish. Cardinal tetras, in fact, were seen in this fast moving water, which was very surprising. Mokenhausia lepidura, Coletti, as we saw all over Colombia and Brycon Melanopterus, and of course there were others that we saw. No exploration today. We've been landlocked to take care of several badly needed repairs to our truck. Two shocks were replaced and one crack shock mount was welded. We gave up on re-welding the front hood clasp and accepted the fact that we would finish our journey with the rope tie down instead. 
We ended up staying in Puerto Carreno this evening due to all the lengthy repairs, not to mention our recovering driver who was just being released from the hospital. We departed early this morning to explore the upper Cano Verde. After some rough travel, we found the stream, but the exploration was disappointing. There was not a great variety of species and the overhanging trees were just too numerous, which greatly reduced the amount of natural light that passed through to the water level and obscured our view. After snorkeling around for a half hour or so, we heard what could only be described as a very large animal which seemed to be following us along the edge of the forest. While we certainly heard the creature, we couldn't see it. Needless to say, we were all on high alert, just in case it decided to join us for a dip. As we departed the rainforest area and entered the plains of the Llanos once again, we visited the Cerros, which consist of massive rock outcrops many meters high. We climbed up the rock surface to witness scenery second to none. We could see out across the plains for many miles, and with the sun starting to set in the background, we were awestruck by the beauty of the Colombian landscape that surrounded us. Some of the fish species that we observed in the upper Cano Verde were some Epistogrammas, Mokenhausia lepidura and coletti, Santa Caperca daemon, an absolutely beautiful cichlid, Leporinus biforis, Leporinus maculatus, and a host of other fish as well. Having spent the previous night in Casuarito, we drove approximately five hours to the Rio Mesetas Rapids, which were conveniently located near our ferry crossing. The fast-moving water was incredible, with striking white sandy beaches and the surrounding rainforest. It was truly a captivating environment. The Rio Mesetas was the largest and fastest moving of all the rivers we snorkeled. The fish were always abundant and traveling in large schools, including the piranha we filmed at the base of the rapids, as well as three species of cichla, Temensis orionocus, the peacock bass, intermedia, and most importantly, Leporinus bruneus, not a cichla, but a Leporinus, which had never been captured previously, a world premiere courtesy of Fluval. After spending half the day snorkeling, filming, and trying to catch fish, it was time to move on to the Rio Tomo. We were delayed almost immediately though by our truck getting stuck in the deep wet sand. We all got out to push through the sediment and up a hill until we reached what I would call an old road. Once again, in very rough shape and looking like no one had driven it in weeks, maybe longer. We wandered through hours of jungle to emerge on a massive rock outcrop, where we again had to disembark, this time just to find a safe path through the maze of boulders. The walking time was actually appreciated after getting bounced around in a jeep for the better part of the day. After crossing through an abandoned town, the kind you'd see in a typical horror movie, we eventually came to a log bridge. While the bridge would have taken us right to the Rio Tomo, it was in such disrepair that should anything have happened, we were days away from the nearest hospital. We had no choice but to abort part of this mission and begin the long return. We finally found the road that would take us back in the direction of civilization, but it was getting very late. Thankfully, we came across a friendly rancher who invited us to dinner and let us set up camp on his property for some shut-eye. Speaking of which, the rest was really necessary as I had to nurse a nagging eye infection. Some of the fish species that we observed in the Rio Mesetas. In cichlids, we saw the Crenichicla orinoco, the Geophagus de Croster, the Biotoma waverini. We saw Severums, the Hero Severus. We saw Cichla temensis, the Orinocos, and the Cichla intermedia. Some of the catfish that we saw were various species of Loricaria, Ancestris, and of course, Pimlodella. In Caracans, we saw a variety of different fish. Semiprochilotus insignis, Mokenhausia lepidura and coletti, like we'd seen in much of the rest of Colombia, uh, Leporinus biforis, and of course, Leporinus bruneus, an absolutely exquisite Leporinus. 
We left the ranch well before daybreak at 3 a.m., heading to an area between the Rio Tomo and Rio Bita. We arrived at a tributary of the Rio Bita, known as the Rio Cu Mariana, later that morning, very fatigued yet always eager to see what we could find. Despite coming across some interesting cichlids and a few other types of fish, we made a stealthy departure not long after due to some African bees nearby. Some of the fish species we observed in the Rio Cu Mariana were Cichlosoma orionopus, Epistogramma species, some Farloellas, Mokenhausia coletti and Lepidura, as we've seen everywhere, and some other species of caracans. With our flight scheduled to leave Bogota in just a couple of days, and with over a thousand kilometers of mostly bad road to cover, it was time to make our way back to the capital. Nonetheless, the desire to explore Villa Vincenzo Samora was with us, despite the lack of sleep and showers we all desperately needed. It was a full day of travel, taking us 15 or so hours to get back to the town. Unfortunately, it was another drive of pure torture. Although the scenery on the way to Villa Vicenzio was certainly beautiful, being a big guy and cramped into the back of a small bouncing 4x4 for that amount of time would have tested even Gandhi's patience. In order to shave off a half dozen hours or so of bad road travel, we decided to alter our route and cross the Rio Mete via ferry. As our 4x4 maneuvered along the sand dunes of the river, we had to stop and ask several natives for directions as the ferry was not easily findable. Once we did finally find our target, we were happy to see it was in good shape, which is more than I can say for the gas tanker parked next to us, which had seriously impaired brakes and several hydraulic fluid leaks. Upon arriving at our hotel late this night, we immediately took hot showers and passed out. Finally, a real bed to sleep in. Before the 100 kilometer drive back to Bogota, which I should mention takes several hours because of the extremely steep gradient and single lane traffic, we decided to make a couple of pit stops for some last minute exploring. At the first stop, we came across a small dried up stream that had a number of trapped small species, such as Corridorus metai. It was loaded with leaf litter and we were surprised to see such a variety of fish thriving, especially in such dry surrounding conditions. We then traveled to a tributary of the Rio Ariari, a very fast moving river, where we hoped to observe some royal plecos. We didn't achieve that goal, but instead found a group of Dalian cistrus and some other cool water species. The water flow was very strong due to the steep gradient, close to a meter per second. The temperature was also much cooler than what we had experienced previously during this trip, likely due to our current location in the mountains. Here we measured water temperature at 12 degrees Celsius. Post our cold dip, it was onto the airport to head back to Canada. I couldn't believe how fast the last 13 days had flown by, but I was reminded of all that we had managed to accomplish in such a short time. Looking back now, bush plane travel would have allowed us to cover an even greater territory, not to mention save my spine from turning into a pretzel. But it was difficult road travel that had earned us the opportunity to discover such unique fish and wildlife. We saw three species of rays in the Rio Mesetas, filmed the first ever footage of Leparinus bruneus, which has only been exported from Colombia one time, and discovered an entirely new pike cichlid in the Cano Mayaragua. We haven't even left the country yet, but I can't wait to get home to share our findings and footage with the rest of the team, not to mention getting started on planning the next Fluval expedition. So many places, so little time. Man, I love my job. <laughs>